webinar. Before we begin with our topic, just a few reminders and housekeeping items. If you would like to download a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, please do so by choosing the file in the file pod that you see there below. Um, also, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please just type those into the Q&A box. Um, we will try to answer as many of those as we are able to at the end of the presentation. Also, if you are looking to earn CME today, this presentation will award one AMA Category 1 credit. Um, please note that you will uh, be given a link to complete in order to be eligible for the CME certificate, and then those will be sent out to you within 10 business days. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and taking time out of your day. Our topic today is HIPAA privacy, back to the basics, um, presented by Kathy Bryant. She is the manager of our cyber services department, and I am Cassie Turner. Many of you have been on our webinars before, so you guys are no stranger to us. And let me start my camera here for you. There we go. Now you all should be able to see us. There we go. Again, Kathy and Cassie, again, you guys aren't strangers to us. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. We hope that you find this presentation uh, helpful and beneficial. We're just going to do a review today of HIPAA, our favorite topic, um, privacy, and the basics and things to you can look out for in your practice. Um, just a disclosure here that Kathy and I have no financial relationship with any ineligible companies to disclose this information. Um, this should not be referred to as a legal source. These are just uh, recommendations and suggestions um, from us to you all today. So our objectives for today are to review the HIPAA privacy basics and identify areas of noncompliance. Describe rules outside of HIPAA and how they may impact patient privacy, and then assess current practice and recommend changes to protect patient privacy in your organization. So, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks, Cassie. I, it's hard to believe that we're talking about the basics of privacy, but in reality, so much of what we hear about practices having issues with HIPAA starts with the privacy rule. You know, the privacy rule, as we'll see actually on the next slide, uh, sorry, two slides, is, a num is quite old. And it was an attempt to create a national standard as far as protecting patient privacy. However, the issue that has uh, come up is with all of our focus switching over to cybersecurity, I think sometimes people are almost forgetting some of the basics of privacy. So we're going to hit a very high level overview of HIPAA privacy. Um, a number of us at TMLT participated in what's called the HIPAA Summit a few, um, well, probably about a month ago. And in that, I think there were a total of three days dedicated to privacy. And so this is something that in a 45 minute or an hour webinar is going to take a lot of, of uh, streamlining. Really, the privacy rule requires two basic things of providers or of medical practices. You have to protect your health information and you have to give individual rights over their protected health information. So I think we've all seen the image of the three little monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I uh, have a HIPAA version of that. That's what I see here, what I hear here, let it be here when I leave here. In other words, 
people in your practices are going to have to communicate about patients all day, every day. However, once you step outside of the office, whether that's to go home in the evening or for the weekend, whatever, you have to separate what you know about patients from the um, what you use on a daily basis. As I said, HIPAA is quite old. The original law was passed back in 1996. And uh, just as kind of an interesting sideline, HIPAA, the HIPAA law said that Congress had, uh, I think it was four years to create the rules for privacy and security. And if they didn't, then Health and Human Services was going to have to write the rules. Well, guess who got to write the rules? It was Health and Human Services. The first set of, the first rule was the HIPAA privacy rule that went into effect in 2003. And that rule covered verbal uh, protected health information, meaning conversations that could be overheard, written, all the stuff we used to put on paper, as well as uh, anything that was electronic. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that we actually saw the HIPAA security rule, which really focused on the security of electronic records come into place. It's a little daunting to think that the, the OCR, or the Office for Civil Rights, part of Health and Human Services, received almost 32,000 HIPAA-related cases last year alone. That's everything from complaints all the way to uh, breach investigations. But I think that shows how much importance people are putting on their privacy. I mean, which one of us has not gotten one or more? You've been notified because your data has been breached letters, whether it was from a healthcare related incident, maybe it was from a financial institution. We're all very keenly aware of how many um, is, uh, of how many breaches are occurring, and is privacy really even a thing anymore? The OCR had thirteen uh, enforcement actions last year for penalties. That's down from twenty twenty two when there were. 22 actually, uh, enforcement activities. I think 2022 was a little higher because they went through kind of a, a, a challenge during the pandemic of, of investigating cases. And so I think there was a little bit of a catch up that year. Um, but the OCR has started sharing on a regular basis what kind of recurring HIPAA compliance issues they are actually seeing in their investigations. The individual right of access is still a huge recurring issue. And Cassie's going to talk to that in just a few minutes. The non-bolded items are really part of the HIPAA security rule. I'll touch on one of those, but not really focus on those today. And then business associate agreements, which that is a huge part of privacy as more and more work tasks get delegated or uh, shared with other organizations to complete that work. Additionally, the HIPAA or the OCR rather, has said, these are what we're focused on this year. The new one that really stands out 
is the Risk Analysis Enforcement Initiative. Um, we see in almost every resolution agreement from the OCR that are, are the end of a breach investigation, almost every single one says that the organization failed to complete a thorough and comprehensive risk analysis. And so a lot of attention is being placed on that, including trying to provide some additional resources. And uh, stay tuned, that may be a future webinar topic uh, in a few months. Um, so, also, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yep, I'm jumping ahead, go ahead. So also the other piece is that um, the HIPAA security rule they are pledging to start reviewing this year, which uh, will also potentially be some new changes coming down the road. Did you have something else on that, Cassie? No, no, you you covered it. So as Kathy was mentioning, is this um, here is the limits on uses and disclosures. As she mentioned, HHS wrote these rules and then OCR is responsible for enforcing them. Um, they like voluntary compliance and civil money, money penalties generally, um, but the privacy rule um, is, was basically the goal is set so that information is shared appropriately um, as needed to promote high quality care and protect what we call PHI or protected health information, which many of you have heard that acronym before. Um, so these are some areas where it is permitted to, to share information. Um, and again, this is a rule that they wanted to have um, with some flexibility so that each entity could decide what was appropriate for their practice. So the OCR would, and the rule would like to say that it is somewhat flexible um, and that there are some areas where there are some hard and fast rules, but also where there's a little bit of flexibility. Um, so to the individual, as Kathy mentioned, individual right to access is still very much a large driver of OCR enforcement. Um, as many of you probably know, you are given 15 business days to provide medical records or disclose information to a patient or their personal representative if they are requesting it. Um, that also, there's lots of other things that go into that as far as fees that you're charging for release, and we won't get into that because it's really in the weeds, but again, you need to be aware of that. Um, permitted uses and disclosures also are for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Uh, treatment could include a consultation between two physicians, referral to um, another physician. We get questions often um, if another physician is requesting records, can we go ahead and send them without an authorization? Is that a permitted use and disclosure? Yes, because it falls under treatment uh, for the patient. So you can provide those records to a referring physician without having the patient sign. If you're very concerned about it, most likely the patient will sign an authorization for that release. But again, under treatment, you have that option. Payment is pretty straightforward. Health care operations, again, case management, what we've kind of been talking about, the core uh, care coordination. You can also release for health plan performance evaluations, medical reviews, audits, uh, underwriting, risk assessments, those types of things. Also, information can be shared. Um, providing an opportunity to agree or object. This is in circumstances where it's clear that the individual is giving um, someone in the room that may be present with them uh, the ability to, to hear their PHI. I say it's always a great idea just to ask if someone is present with the patient that you're not maybe sure who they are, or if it's a new family member or a friend that's accompanying them, asking them, uh, the patient, are you comfortable with me sharing your information with um, this person? It seems as implied that they're there with the patient, but I think it's always a good idea to go ahead and just ask them. Um, another thing that falls under this opportunity to uh, uh, agree or object is if a facility directory in a hospital, uh, patients can opt out of those types of things um, if they don't want to participate, but it can be included also without having to um, to get their their um, authorization. Um, again, the, the rule is asking for reasonable safeguards that you establish within your practice, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, but also information can be released that's permitted uh, for public interest. 
Uh, some of those are public health, uh, anything that involves victims of abuse or neglect or domestic violence. Uh, some health oversight agencies, governmental agencies may have access and without having an authorization needed. Uh, some judicial proceedings, uh, law enforcement, uh, funeral directors and coroners determine cause of death, uh, tissue and organ donation. And then if there's a concern of serious threat or health and safety or harm to the public, information can be shared uh, there as well, also in, uh, with workman's compensation. And then the final one, we won't get into this very at all, but limited data sets for the purpose of research. If you're doing uh, research, then you'll want to make sure that you have a data use agreement um, outlining the safeguards. But these are areas where the HIPAA privacy rule does allow uh, permitted use and disclosure. Now, having said that, they also encourage us to share minimally necessary information. Um, they don't really define what minimally necessary is. It's really left to you, the covered entity, to make a reasonable effort to identify what information is needed from that request and then to only disclose that information um, that is needed. And not you may not release the entire medical record, maybe only a portion of it. Um, so you'll want to have policies and procedures in place. We've talked about these in many uh, of our webinars in the past. That's kind of your, your starting point and your foundation is your written HIPAA. Uh, privacy and security policies and procedures. So you'll want to have those outlining um, how you're defining minimally necessary and, and those types of things. So minimally necessary is not um, applied to these sets of groups here. Uh, a request by healthcare for treatment, a provider or an institution for treatment that you can share. Um, disclosure to the individual, so the patient or their representative. Um, if there's an authorization in place, then yes, you can release at that, you know, for that. Disclosure to HHS for the complaint investigation or use and disclosure to law um, or any other administrative rules that may apply. So you have to kind of look at them, make sure that you have all your policies in place, like I mentioned, and know your rules so that you know that you're releasing the appropriate information to the appropriate um, sources here. So individual rights, again, as we've mentioned a couple of times, individuals have the right to access, review, and attain a copy of their PHI. Um, they can also request that uh, corrections be made. If they request uh, that something be changed, then it needs to be reviewed and either accepted or denied. Um, that, that's also another policy that you would want to have in place is your, your structure of how you review any request to change any corrections or amendments in the health information record. Um, they also receive notifications about how their information is being used. Um, it's called an accounting of disclosure. So their information is being disclosed to uh, a health plan or to uh, an insurance provider for underwriting purposes. Those are um, disclosures that you would want to be able to provide to the patient or their representative if they were to ask. Um, they can make decisions on specific information sharing. And then they can also file complaints if they believe their rights are violated or their information is mishandled. And as many of you know, this is very easy to do. It's a website or a phone number, phone call where these complaints can be made um, pretty straightforward. So there are a few exceptions for individual privacy rights. Those are around psychotherapy notes. You would want to uh, protect those. Uh, information compiled for legal proceedings and things related to CLIA. Uh, laboratory results or information held for certain research laboratories. But again, it's it's a small group of exceptions. By and large, the, the vast majority of the record and the rights are going to, to be in favor of the individual patient or their representative. So we get this question sometimes in our risk management department, can a, a request be denied? If the patient is asking for their records, um, do we have to provide it to them? Um, we would say we would never deny them for ability to pay. If they can't afford to pay your fee, then go ahead and just provide them a, a copy of the record for free. We don't want to um, create a, a barrier to them getting their information. But if you're concerned that there's going to be some harm um, that could come as a result of giving the patient their medical record, uh, 
then to that individual, to themselves or to someone else, then in that situation, yes, it, you could deny it. I don't think we see this happen very often, but if it were to happen, we would strongly recommend that you document very clearly the reason why you um, denied the record um, release and have that as part of a, where you can access it, have it accessible. Maybe it's not exactly a note within the chart, but you know where it's at and you can have that available if you need it. Um, and then these situations, an individual must be given a right to have these denials reviewed um, for a second opinion. So just have that in the back of your mind if you do deny that for any particular reason. And then final at some ad administrative requirements that are, uh, again, this is a very high overview and each of these little bullet points have detailed information that goes with them. We've already mentioned uh, policies and procedures that you're required to have. You're required to have a, a privacy officer assigned. You're required to do workplace training and sanctions in place, having a complaint process that's um, known, having mitigation if there's any harm that may become of some protected health information that's uh, disclosed inappropriately or in violation of your rules that there's a mitigation efforts. You have data safeguards, um, retaliation, there's no retaliation if someone is participating in a complaint, um, and then documentation. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you're maintaining your policies and procedures and all of your HIPAA rules and security risk assessments and the things that you're doing to show reasonable efforts that you're maintaining those, I believe, for six years is the current uh, requirement. And if I'm wrong on that, Kathy, please correct me. No, I think that's absolutely correct. So one of the things we really wanted to mention um, and spend just a, a couple of minutes on is business associate uh, so business associate agreements. You know, a business associate is anyone who basically has the ability to do work on your behalf that is not part of your workforce. So if you use um, any kind of service uh, to work on your behalf, a billing company is a great example. You're going to provide them protected health information to allow them to do billing, and then they're going to pass that information on so that you get paid ultimately. You are required to obtain satisfactory assurances from your business associate that they are appropriately protecting your uh, patient information that you give them. This is really important because about 25% of all of the large breaches that were reported to the OCR last year is that uh, stated or was from a business associate. And that number has continued to grow. Originally, um, several years ago, we didn't hear about business associates um, being part of breaches but they are now. And so it's really important that you take a look at your business associate agreement if you're providing it to someone and make sure you feel comfortable with all the things that you're asking them to do, how they're going to use the protected health information you provide. And all of that can be found in a model business associate uh, agreement or contract on the OCR or HHS website, and it's hyperlinked on this slide. You do not have to use the exact terms. I think one of the things that in the model um, BAA says that the business associate has up to 60 days to notify you if they've had a breach. The general feeling I'm here from cyber attorneys is that is far, far too long, that they suggest something more like five business days or two business days after 
the uh, breach is confirmed. So you might want to take a look at your existing BAA. The other thing is if you're dealing with a very large company, oh, maybe an EHR vendor, for instance, uh, or a large um, cloud provider, they're going to write the business associate agreement in their best interest. And I would pay a special attention to indemnity clauses that they may add in there or, or hold harmless clause from saying you won't hold them um, if they make a mistake or have a breach. So we're going to take a real quick polling question because this is probably one of the hottest topics in healthcare uh, today. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about change healthcare. But as most of you know, the end of February, change healthcare, which is part of Optum, which is part of the United Healthcare Group, had a huge um, what we presume is going to be a huge security incident and pretty much shut down their operations for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, I've heard that a lot of the systems are back up and working again, but if that is, um, you know, that's still going to be a huge backlog. I read this week that there were... $18 billion in a backlog of claims that they had uh, to process. The only reason I asked the question is we just wanted to get a feel from the audience today as to whether the uh, change healthcare incident was affecting you. And clearly the majority of you do have, have had um, been affected and Interestingly, uh, the a fair amount of you have a direct contract or BAA with Change Healthcare, because often if you have a business associate, then the business associate that does billing, they may have the contract with Change Healthcare and not you directly. Thanks for participating, by the way. So if you remember back in the very beginning, we talked about that, um, that the federal law or HIPAA privacy was really designed to create a nationwide privacy law. And unfortunately, in the last few years, what we have seen is everybody almost trying to figure out their own state privacy law. I think most people know that California kind of led the pack with uh, saying, we're going to have a really, really, really strong privacy law. And um, they have proceeded with that and they've ac actually even amended it. Texas has a new privacy law, and I'll talk about that one on the next slide. But the thing that I think, while we look at this colorful map, is that you may not only be treating patients from Texas. Maybe you live in Texarkana and you have patients from both Texas and Arkansas, or maybe you're in um, El Paso or, or one of the other western side of Texas, you may have patients coming across state lines for treatment. When those kinds of things occur, and if you had a breach, you would have to report the breach in whatever state the patient resides in, according to their laws. Now, that's where having a really good cyber attorney helps because they figure out all that stuff and they take care of it. So I mentioned that Texas has the new 
Data Privacy and Security Act. It was passed in the last legislative session and it's in effect or goes into effect on July 1st of this year. Here's the good news. If you're a HIPAA covered entity, you are exempt from, um, from the uh, HIPAA privacy rule. Or I'm sorry, not the HIPAA privacy rule, but you're exempt from this new Texas law. There's also the Texas Identity Theft and Enforcement Act. This one's been around for a while. Uh, it's a Texas Business and Commerce Code, and it not only deals with healthcare, but it includes all those other things like driver's license and uh, credit card information, all those things that a business might be collecting that might not rise to healthcare information. And then, of course, the Texas Medical Privacy Act. Um, it is sort of the backbone of all Texas healthcare laws um, from a, a privacy standpoint. But, uh, you know, this is the law that makes it that you have to release records within 15 days and uh, do training within 90 days as opposed to what the federal law says, which is as soon as possible. But there are a lot of other Texas laws that have something hidden in them that deal with privacy. And we're not going to go through all these, but they're included just in the event that you would uh, have any kind of, of concern or anything that shows up about them. Um, let's see, uh, and just a few more that the last two are the, the two that we've already are talked about, the last three, I guess. So one of the initiatives that the OCR did take on, it's actually, it seems like it's been going on for two or three years, is trying to simplify and coordinate the efforts and the rules of HIPAA and 42 CFR Part 2, which is um, which was a separate set of rules that re were in re relation to treating patients with substance abuse disorders. Before there was a uh, a thought that, well, there wasn't a thought, you had to actually have a separate release if you were going to release substance abuse disorder records. Now you can use a single form. Previously, you could not disclose or redisclose records that you had received on substance abuse. Um, you had to have a separate breach notification process for substance abuse patients if their records were breached. The good news is they've tried to resolve all these things. The people that deal with substance abuse patients say that this has been very positive and uh, we hope that the references that we're providing here, if you do treat substance abuse disorders, that maybe those would be helpful for you. We've talked on a number of occasions about information blocking. Information blocking is a rule that uh, requires that you not interfere with access ex or exchange of electronic health information. Year over year, we continue to see the most common complaint being lodged about information blocking being that of physician offices. And I'm not going to take the time to go into this today, but information blocking is a big deal. 
thought you might be interested to know that the Federal Trade Commission has been in, started enforcing federal consumer protection laws that prevent fraud, deception, and unfair practices, including those of healthcare. And this is one of the most recent ones. Uh, it basically involved Rite Aid, a pharmacy that, impl- uh, that deployed surveillance equipment and that they did not have adequate security policies. And so when this became, uh, there was a complaint filed to the FTC and the FTC said that in fact, Rite Aid was in violation of their data security order by failing to adequately oversee service providers or the company that they had hired to install this. Um, So the upshot is they had to remove all that. They couldn't use facial recognition technology for security or surveillance purposes for a period of at least five years. And they had to start actually um, uh, doing a lot of corrective action. So we wanted to wrap up with just kind of a a quick little checklist of 10 things that if you walk away today and are able to answer, uh, yes, I have this, yes, this is in place, you'll probably be in pretty good shape if your practice, um, as far as your practice in HIPAA compliance. So you need to have a designated privacy officer. One of the things, depending on the size of your practice, is you may want to periodically have someone, probably not the privacy officer, Just randomly select new workforce members and ask them, do you know who the privacy officer is? The privacy officer should be someone that everyone knows who is, and they should feel comfortable going to them if they do have a concern that a patient's privacy may uh, may be an issue. I think one of the biggest things that everyone needs to know is what is protected health information? You know, those good old 18 identifiers that we all learned way back in HIPAA 101, um, those are still there. They haven't ever been changed. And I'm kind of imagining they won't ever be changed. Permissible uses and disclosures. Workforce members have to understand the differences in required and permissible use and disclosure. Cassie covered that really well. I think it's really important that they also know what consent do they use when a certain situation arises. Um, As far as authorizations, I was just mentioning that, you know, you should have a separate authorization if a patient is requesting their own records that is not uh, overly onerous on the patient as opposed to the Fed or an authorization that covers HIPAA. Uh, If you haven't switched to the Texas Attorney General's uh, recommended form, that's one that you may want to look at. Um, I I talked with a cyber attorney the other day, and their comment was, who wouldn't use it? So think about that. Notice of privacy practices. We have been promised, gosh, I think it's been for eight years that the requirement for getting a signed um, acceptance, or not an acceptance, but a a notice of privacy practice acknowledgement 
is going to go away. Um, stay tuned. They say it's still on the radar. I don't know when it's going to go into effect, but we'll let you know when it does. Cassie talked a bit about the uh, responding to requests for privacy protection. So if a patient says um, that they don't want anyone to have access to their medical information, how do you make that note? How do you, you know, make sure that that is not something that accidentally gets released? One of the things we advocate is when you have a form that says you may release my information to such and such and such a person, do you update that at least annually? Because we know relationships change. You know, uh, someone that had previously allowed their their spouse, maybe they've gone through a divorce and that spouse would potentially still like to have access to their record. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> you need to have a procedure for responding to those requests for access. An individual right to access is still the number one thing that the OCR is um, investigating and fining practices and other um, covered entities for. But don't forget, patients still have a right to correct or request a correction to their records and also have them transferred to a third party. You want to maintain an accounting of disclosures. This is one I don't worry about. HIPAA has been around a long time now, and I can count on two hands the number of times that I've ever heard of anyone ever requesting it. It may be happening out there, and it's just not an issue, but I, I wouldn't lose any sleep over this. Workforce training is probably the number one thing that you can do to help make sure that you don't have privacy issues because your workforce are going to be your first line of defense and your last line. And document, 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 document. How many times can we say that? You have to have documented policies and procedures. You have to um, keep all of the HIPAA-related information for at least six years from the last time they were in force. I'm going to switch over to our Q&A. Um, we may actually have to flip back to a previous slide before the poll because I think we've somehow lost some of the questions. But let me start with that the um, as Cassie covered in the beginning, CME credit is available for today's presentation. You will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the presentation today. Once you have those, um, have received that, if you would fill out the CME evaluation and return it you will get your, your CME certificate emailed to you in about 10 business days. So Cassie, do you want, to, I'll, I'll take the first question since it's about business associates. Sure. Uh, my rule has always been to have a business associate sign my BAA. Very often, I find companies presenting me with theirs. This seems wrong to me when they are my BAA. Certainly agree with you that it is the covered entity's responsibility to have the business associate agreement. 
However, um, there are many instances, especially with the larger vendors, that they're insisting on you signing their agreement. If you want to redline or change their agreement, it's probably going to require taking um, a, a, a an attorney being involved. Uh, the next question is about clarification on my comment on the Attorney General authorization form, but not for the patient requesting their own information. Uh, that is correct. You do need something more simple. If you've ever looked at that Attorney General form, it's pretty busy. So uh, a very simplified form is all you need. Um, does TMLT sign, uh, sell a practice management policy binder? Uh, no, we do not, but you might want to check with TMA. Cassie, if a patient does not want their records sent to their primary physician, uh, despite the primary physician needing these, what should they tell the patient? I think if the if there these records don't fall into one of the exceptions of needing uh, an authorization, that there would be a permitted disclosure for the purpose of treatment. And Kathy, feel free to uh, either agree or disagree. Um, we we do get this question, and generally, if it is for the purpose of treatment and there is not an exception, um, I think it might be worth having a conversation with the patient, too, to understand what, what it is that they're not wanting um, their primary doctor to have and maybe explaining to them that, you know, for the continuity of their care and they're, you know, getting the best care that they can, that it is a reasonable request for the primary care doctor to see those, those notes. I, I agree. Um, the problem that may come up is if the patient has expressed that concern or that request not to share the records, I think it could be a gray area. So having that conversation with the patient and figuring out what you can share uh, is probably the best way to go. Can a patient request that their records be changed and delete a past medical history notation uh, that they indicated in the office visit? You certainly um, can expect that those may actually occur. However, you ultimately have the right to refuse the request to change the record. So you have to have the documentation that you received it, that you reviewed it, and you made the decision to, um, to not make the change. So all of that comes into uh, your policy and procedure as well. Oh, Cassie, I'm going to give this one to you, if you don't mind. What can I legally charge a patient for medical records? So, yeah, we, we hinted at this earlier. It can, is a bit a topic that we have an actual whole webinar dedicated to. But for the sake of this and very high, high level, the government HHS allows you to charge $6.50 um, to release records. And I did see uh, another question on the other uh, Q&A about not providing those records in paper. There are some additional rules that state that it is the form and format that the patient requests 
So if they're requesting paper copies and that's not an undue burden and unreasonable request to your practice, then you will want to provide them um, in the form and format that they're asking. If for some reason you do not want to charge $6.50, there's a nifty little math equation that you can come up with to determine what it would actually cost your practice as far as time, uh, accessories, et cetera, for these, for release of records, and you come up with this, that should be in your policy and procedure manual, and then you can consistently charge that um, rate to patients. And again, as I mentioned before, I believe the OCR will encourage you if a patient cannot pay for their records to release them for free. Um, so uh, again, we have a whole webinar dedicated just to this topic, I think, because it gets a little confusing sometimes, but 650 is a safe bet, I think. Or, or give them to them for free. Yeah, and let me just clarify, that is directly to the patient. We're not talking about a third party release to an attorney or, or somewhere like that. That's a different set of rules. Um, it does say for the patient's records, it didn't say to whom directly. So for third party, it is a different set of rules, but those rules, the $6.50 are direct to the patient. So the um, there is a question about uh, from a, a practice that has, the practice is now closed and their EMR subscription has converted to limited access. And there's a, a difficult issue with patients who did not previously sign up for the portal getting access. So the subscription, um, is this an issue? I think it is an issue because number one, under Texas law, the Texas Medical Board expects you to provide the records um, or the person that you have named a custodian. And so there is potentially a problem for you. Um, I know it would be great to put it back on the, the vendor, but if you have access and the patient requests the records through you, then you need to be able to grab those, uh, or not grab those, but actually share those. I'm going to flip back and see if I can pull up that other set of questions before the poll. Ah, there they are. Okay. Um, maybe not. Yeah, I'm not seeing them. I thought they were going to come back with, it looks like the same ones. Uh, Cassie, do you, let's see, it would be the patient's responsibility to tell us she needs to update her medical consent and release of information. This would be like if she got a divorce and does not want her husband to get access. The reality is if you, um, sure, it, it makes perfect sense that the person would update that. However, if it's in your best interest in trying to protect the patient's records from inappropriate use or disclosure, to see about getting that updated periodically. Um, if there is a conflict between HHS, let's see, between HHS requirements and TMB requirements, which one supersedes? It depends on which is the most restrictive. The example of HHS requires that you release records within 30 days of the request. Texas Medical Board is 15 business days. And HHS has said publicly uh, in meetings that if you have um, a chance, or not if you have a chance, but if you actually um, if you don't do the 15 days and you're under investigation, they're going to know it. 
Um, let's see. I'm going to... Stephanie magically found the questions. Let me see if I can get them pulled up in this other... In this... In an email. Um, While you're doing that, Kathy, there was a question about sharing um, results with a patient if there is someone accompanying them in the office or hospital room. Does that violate HIPAA? It doesn't necessarily violate. Again, if you can ask the patient to, you know, provide their consent or their authorization at least verbally, that's a good idea. Um, sometimes it's implied, but we are always on the safe side, especially from a risk manager perspective, just encouraging, that, encouraging you to have that discussion with the patient so that um, if they're aware and they can make that decision and just confirm with you that it's okay to share that information. Um, there could be sometimes when there's someone with the patient, um, just being aware of different scenarios, like I hate to even say these types of things, but human trafficking and whatnot. So it is good to just, you know, double check. Um, even though there might be someone in the room and it might be implied, I think it's appropriate to ask. Okay. So one of the questions uh, that mysteriously got lost in cyberspace is <laughs> that uh, the question is, how do the HIPAA privacy rules affect practices that do not accept any insurance and no Medicare or Medicaid? I think you have to go back and really look at the original definition of a HIPAA covered entity. And uh, if, if you do not meet that definition of a HIPAA covered entity, then you're going to want to look at the Texas Medical Board, or not Texas Medical Board, but the Texas Medical Records Privacy Act. Um, to make sure that you don't meet the the uh, definition of a covered entity in Texas, because literally all you have to do is pr uh, possess medical records in Texas, and that makes you have to meet the Medical Records Privacy Act in Texas. If a doctor's, Cassie, maybe you can do this one. If a doctor's office calls requesting records um, and the practice did not refer them, can we release the records without a form? And would this fall under treatment? Yeah, I think this is similar to the one we were talking about earlier that it could be deemed as treatment. I still think it's reasonable to ask the patient and if they self-referred themselves to, to someone, a specialist or something, and just double checking just to be on the safe side. I think if, if they provide you, if the referring physician is providing you a form that shows that they've signed off and you can verify, you know, a signature and identity that it is a legitimate um, authorization that they provide, provided to request the records, then I think it could be okay. But again, I'm on the more conservative side, just uh, just to say, hey, it's worth a call to the patient just to confirm. But um, I think if it's under the treatment definition of treatment, then you can release it without having uh, an authorization. Yes, I agree. I think that uh, we probably have time for one more question. And this one is one that we get a fair amount. If there is a credit card dispute, someone comes in, is seen, pays for the visit with a credit card, and then complains to the credit card company that that was not an authorized charge, can we release records? This is a tough one. Because, of course, you want to release the records to prove that the patient was actually seen. However, you need to have authorization from that patient. So you can either tell the credit card company they need to send you an authorization. Because chances are the patient's not going to authorize you to release that information. So this is not one that most people like the answer when we give it, 
but um, you really need an authorization to share that information with the, the credit card company. So our hour is coming to a close. Um, if there are additional questions that we didn't get to, just note that cyber at tmlt.org is probably the best email address to email questions to. You, should, you can look for the email tomorrow with the link to the recording as well as to, uh, to the CME evaluation. I hope everyone has a great rest of the week and take care. Any questions or any last comments, Cassie? No, thank you guys for participating and um, being engaged with your questions. Also, thanks to our behind the scenes team helping us out today and getting those questions over so we could actually see them. And finally, thank you for your topics for future uh, webinars. We appreciate your ideas. All right. Have a great day.